All right. Hello, everyone. I hope you enjoyed your first assignment and you learned a lot there. Um, one uh, request from uh, lots of people from both this class and also outside of this class uh, has been around disentanglement, which I know we don't touch that much on in the Coursera course. It's like very brief and probably just the teaser. Uh, so to make it a little bit less of a teaser uh, and to go into it a little bit more, um, I prepared this presentation um, for you all. And so I'm going to talk about uh, disentanglement um, first by motivating it and why we use it, um, implementing it a bit, uh, how we might measure it and think about measuring it, um, as well as uh, talk about some hot off the press work on it. And I will be doing this with cute dogs. <laughs> so this corgi is clearly entangled in uh, uh, lights. All right, so my first question for you is, how would you describe all the major features of dogs? Let's say your model is trying to model all dogs. How would you describe all the major features of dogs? Well, it might be helpful to look at several dogs here. Um, so you might take a look at this and think, oh, well, fur color is one major axis along which things change, right? One of the major big features there. Um, maybe the air, uh, ear floppiness is another one. Uh, maybe eye color, maybe something to do with the tongue droopiness, um, the size of the dog. Uh, so let's say you put together these uh, major features here. And so these are pretty good features along which we can adapt uh, these dog images and maybe represent all of dogs. But instead, if you came up with a list like this, where one thing that we can adapt things on is size and fur type and nose color all at once, I would probably ask, you know, this is not the best way to represent all dogs, like the space of all dogs here. Uh, and so if these were the different major axes of features along which we could adapt these dog, dog pictures, I'd say this is not a really good way of representing that space. Instead, I would much prefer this compact representation. And that's kind of what uh, disentanglement boils down to and why it's useful. It's that we want these compact representations of our data. Uh, we want to find a good representation is probably one that is very, very compact uh, and that gets at these major, maybe you can call them principal components of our data. And arguably it would be, this is like the most compact way you could probably represent our data because they are just the major features as opposed to that entangle, that, that mess you saw there. All right, so this is supposed to be a dog compactly uh, stuffed into a violin or cello or something um, case. Uh, and this is a better one of a cat um, that I found, cool. All right, so more concretely, in your GAN, what does this look like? Well, you have your noise vector, right, in latent space. And let's say this is your noise vector in five dimensions. So you can imagine uh, the lighter values maybe being smaller and the darker values uh, being larger. So these are, this is just representing you know, a vector of numbers. And this is your noise vector. And maybe the dimensions of your noise vector correspond to some of those different features. Uh, but let's say in general, your noise vector produces these features, which represent, of course, that image, right? Okay. In an entangled model, this is what this looks like, where each dimension of your noise vector impacts a lot of different downstream features all at once, okay? Um, versus in a disentangled model, uh, each axis of your noise vector, each dimension there, only adapts one of those major features while keeping the others untouched. And so concretely what that would look like is, let's say we take a look at this first dimension of size, you see that white square up there. And let's say this entire noise vector produces, is it, this is your pre-trained generator, it produces this image of a dog, of an adult golden retriever. And so watch the vector on the left, that size, uh, that size cell in this vector, that value that's white right now turn black. And let's say we change the size. And now what your model is producing when you input this vector 
is this smaller golden retriever, okay? And just the size change, it's still the same breed kind of, kind of situation. Um, and so it's that, that's what you would want from your model. Okay. And uh, of course, this is actually just this one, we want this one thing to change because we didn't tell the model the, the size, it doesn't actually know its size necessarily. So what's important is that one thing has changed, um, but all else has been more or less kept the same in terms of features. All right, so what this wouldn't, what wouldn't be good, like to contrast this, is if this vector produced this image of, of a corgi instead, or yeah, <laughs> instead. Um, and you know, it's not just the, it's not just the size change. A lot of other things change too. You know, the fur color, the ears are now perky, like, and and the expression is definitely a little different. <laughs> Um, you're still in the car, so I guess like, you know, you know, some of the setting is still the same, still dog, still dog, but many things have changed here uh, by changing that one, um, that one value that in that one dimension. Okay, so um, ideally, as you look on the left of those three noise vectors there, and you just change that top cell to different values, ideally, you would get these three images of dogs getting smaller, right? Um, and uh, one way to think about this is if you look at the features of all the dogs in, in the data on the right, you get, you get more or less similar features from each of them. You get golden fur, you get floppy ears, um, you get black nose. Um, you, get, you get that general idea. Of course, the size has changed, but everything else is more or less constant. And we kind of, we call that the perceptual path length. So perceptually, based on their features, the distance between these images is fairly small. Okay, it doesn't change that much in the data and the features. And it, it's so the perceptual path length, PPL, is small. And that is a good thing for disentanglement, because when we walk along the latent space, along that one dimension in latent space, we expect this path length to be quite small if it's disentangled. And so this is what we want. And of course, a bad one, an entangled model would have a large perceptual path length where the distance between the features of each of these images is quite large, even as we move in latent space, not that much. Okay. So what's cool here is that perceptual path length is, uh, was introduced by the StyleGAN paper, uh, which you guys might have heard about a little bit, uh, which is one of the state of the arts in, in generating awesome images. Uh, and they introduced PPL for as a way to measure disentanglement because the more change there is when we walk along latent space, uh, the more change there is in the resulting generated images, um, the, the more disentangled we think this model is. And so it's a really good proxy for measuring disentanglement. And then in a follow-on paper known as StyleGAN2, um, which is clearly a follow-up paper <laughs> to StyleGAN, uh, they actually use PPL um, in the training itself to penalize this situation that you see here of these very varying dogs as you, as you uh, walk along latent space. And instead, they would want to reward this instead. Okay, and overall, this is great because this also results in not, not only disentang uh, better disentanglement, but also a smoother noise space. And what I mean by that is as you walk along your noise vector in different places, you actually get quite a smooth uh, motion in, in your data space. The, the images you're getting change uh, less drastically, less, less in crazy ways. So if you see this, a uh, picture of Obama here on the left, that is real Obama. Uh, and on the right is a style GAN um, trying to basically find, uh, or it, it's a model trained based on style GAN, but it's trying to find um, Obama in, in the latent space. And it is actually quite smooth. Um, and so this is an example of projection, which is kind of doing the opposite of what your generator is doing, going from latent space to data. And it's like, instead, let's go from data to, to our latent space to find that corresponding latent. 
And that's valuable because uh, if you want any real image, for example, this image of Obama, you would have to do that because, or you could keep sampling from your style GAN uh, for a long time before you find Obama. Uh, so I would probably suggest not doing that. So instead you wanna go the opposite direction. This is also a possible not not just in the image domain, but uh, in this is for uh, voices for audio. Um, and on the left, you're seeing a visualization of the different speaker embeddings that are uh, very much clustered around the speak uh, individual speakers. So the model knows that these are separate speakers, but on the right is the content where the content is very much um, everyone speaks about every speaker more or less speaks about everything. Um, so they're able to the model is able to model this um, uh, content versus style. Uh, this is also very useful in uh, facial recognition models. And so you would want, let's say, the content of a face recognizing who that person is at different, let's say, poses. Um, so no matter what pose this person is in, you would want to still recognize this person as Bob, for example. So if you're familiar, or if you recall the conditional GAN that you have learned about, you put in your noise vector into your generator, and then you have this um, condition that you have, which is the class, which could be, um, which could be like a cat or a dog if you're generating different uh, animals. Um, but here, what the uh, what this work has done is, okay. <laughs> uh, what this work has done is um, instead learn a disentangled representation of pose versus uh, that content of who that person is and actually make that make that part of their model such that the model is able to uh, understand um, understand pose versus uh, the facial identity of that person. And you can see that here in the middle layer um, where uh, the generator is actually has an encoder and encodes it into those different features and then decodes that over there. This is also very relevant in video. Uh, and so these are two very recent papers that were just accepted a few days ago, I guess, uh, to iClear um, 2021. Sorry, I should say 2021 down there. Um, and it's uh, content versus motion for video. So if you can disentangle uh, the content of a video versus, for example, like this person's face versus the actual motion, the diff between frames, um, that's a very compact representation you have there of video. And you can see that here on the left with faces and also here uh, with, with chairs. Uh, another piece of work that uh, a TA here, Eric, and I have worked on and was recently accepted to, I'm sorry, I kept writing 2020, but this is all 2021, I guess, work. Um, uh, is around evaluating disentanglement. Uh, so disentanglement, um, perhaps you can evaluate it not with just PPL that you saw there, but also by understanding um, how your latent space, uh, as you move along your latent space, what the resulting data space might look like. And we looked at specifically the topology of uh, the resulting manifolds uh, of of that lane space, and I can go into this into in in another lecture that goes into you know manifold theory a little bit more. But the idea is that you know maybe different latent vectors uh, or latent dimensions uh, have for scale and rotation of these hearts that you see here. Uh, maybe they have you know different um, types of manifold or or different types of topologies, different types of shapes coming out. Um, uh, when you condition on certain values of them. I'll go into that much more. This is, it requires a lot of time. Um, so related, very much related to disentanglement is the discovery of different latent directions, uh, particularly without supervision. And I think this past year has really, really honed in on this. Um, lots of cool papers, best papers, uh, and I, I really liked this paper where essentially they had a pre-trained GAN and they were able to immediately find a lot of uh, different directions that you can move along latent space to find, you know, change the thickness of something, change someone's hair, change the rotation, 
um, change how much background there is uh, behind that person. And so that's really, really cool because this means that you don't need to explicitly tell the model anything. You can grab any model that's already trained right now and find these directions. Uh, and it's a bit of a teaser related to that. Um, uh, there is an amazing website um, called artbreeder.com. And what it's getting at is you can create all of these generated outputs of GANs and you can edit their quote unquote genes. And these genes are essentially your latent space vectors, your, your noise vectors, right? And you can go in certain directions. And these are directions that people have found as, you know, oh, age, for example, if you go in that direction, you can actually get someone who looks older or younger. And these are, of course, your Snapchat filters right now. Um, but I think the coolest thing that this website has is, uh, and this is not a, an announced feature yet, but um, it is like, like a certain number of people do have it, is to create your own genes. And that's what they call it, genes. And so you can find and discover these things yourselves. And uh, they essentially are crowdsourcing um, the ability to find these genes. And it's quite incredible what they've been able to find. Like there's a, for Game of Thrones fans, there's a white walker gene that someone found and you can make anyone look like a white walker. Um, and so that's pretty cool. All right, and with that, I think I will open it up for questions, but that is that is the gist of disentanglement. Um, and uh, I hope if you're interested in this space uh, to dive deeper in it and happy to, happy to answer questions and happy to also ping over uh, relevant papers that might be useful.